The Collector by Wilhelm Stiekel from Disguises of Love, translated by Rosalie Gabler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Collector He is to be found in every variety. There is not a single article which may not conceivably become an object of his passion for collecting. If he is fond of art, he collects pictures, engravings, antiquities, china, first editions, bronzes. Should he be of a scientific turn of mind, he starts herbariums, catches butterflies, piles up minerals, coins, bacteria, abnormalities or his passion leads him to collect stamps, clocks, walking sticks, umbrellas, ink pots, buttons, hats, furniture, lamps, fire screens. Sometimes this collecting mania is bound up with erotic interests. In this case, he will be on the hunt for corsets, shoes, handkerchiefs, aprons, petticoats, ribbons, stockings, garters, plates of hair, Curls, gloves, nail files, crutches. All these are authentic cases. They all have in common the mania for collecting and the emotion entailed by the act of acquisition. The compulsion to possess the coveted object is so great that in pathological cases it leads to crime. Those who have never cultivated collecting do not know the tortures and the ecstasies involved in the acquisition of every new specimen, the weighing and considering, the anticipation, the desire, the struggle against the ever-growing passion, the final surrender, the dread lest the desired object should come into the possession of another, the fever of possession, the caressing, handling, examining, absorption, the ecstasy of the first days of possession, the gradual disappointment, the eclipse of the old by the new favorite. An emotional overestimation of the beloved object is peculiar to all collectors. It goes without saying that the picture collector possesses a genuine Rembrandt, Van Dyck, Durer, Schindler, Pettenkofen, or some other canvas to which he attaches great value. Some even take great care not to allow a close examination of the picture, for fear lest they might be disillusioned. Illusion is as essential to collecting as it is to love. Just as a lover overestimates his beloved and can find no faults, but only excellencies in her, so it is in the case of the collector. He has the very finest specimen of its kind. Nobody else has its equal. This pride in the rarity of a thing is typical of all collectors, and in this they resemble the man who wants to have the most beautiful wife. It will be noticed that I am laying stress on the erotic aspect of the collecting mania, but I am not unmindful of its other aspects. No doubt the stamp collector travels round the globe by means of his stamps. He lives in the history of the stamp. He dethrones kings and celebrates memorable historic events through the possession of a particular stamp. But when all is said and done, it is but a harem that every collector establishes for himself. Poets have exhaustively described this collecting mania. Out of the host of examples before me, I will choose a very telling one, which Kierkegaard has left us. It is a significant fact that this poet-philosopher, the fanatical admirer of Mozart's Don Juan, himself the philosopher of Don Juanism, and the author of a remarkable and erotic diary, should by his own confession prove to be himself a collector. He describes the acquisition of an old writing table. Quote, some seven years ago I caught sight of a writing table at a second-hand dealer's which immediately took my fancy. It was not in the modern style, and rather the worse for wear, but it interested me. It is impossible to describe the emotion I passed through, but I suppose most people have had similar experiences. 
My daily routine led me past the writing table at the dealer's, and I never failed to look at it lovingly in passing. In due course, this interest in the writing table became an event in my life. It became a necessity of my existence to see it, and I would even make a detour on its account. The more often I saw it, the stronger grew my desire to possess it. I knew well enough that this was an extravagant wish, as I had no use for it, and had to confess that it would be sheer waste of money to purchase it. But it is notorious that a craving will find itself some excuse. One day I stepped into the dealer's, and after asking about various other things, I was on the point of going when I casually made a very low offer for the writing table. I thought it possible that the dealer might close with the offer, and then it would have been through a lucky chance that the desk became mine. It was certainly not a question of money that suggested this point of view, but the desire to ease my conscience. But the attempt failed. The dealer was unusually determined. For a while I continued to pass by daily and to cast enamored glances at the writing table. I must decide one way or the other, I thought to myself, for once the writing table is gone, it will be too late, and even if I were to succeed in tracing it again, I should no longer get the same satisfaction out of it. My heart thumped as I entered the shop again and bought and paid for the table. This shall be the last time I will be guilty of such extravagance, I thought. It is really lucky that I have bought it, for now, every time I look at it, it will remind me of my extravagance. This writing table shall start a new era in my life. Depraved desire is so plausible, and the way to hell is paved with good resolutions. The writing table was placed in my room, and, as in the first days of my passion, I found my joy in regarding it from the street, I now paced up and down before it at home. By and by, I got to know its interior, the countless drawers, pigeonholes, and shelves, and was in every way delighted with my writing table. End quote. I have nothing to add to this description. There is no need to emphasize or explain anything. The various stages of the passion could not be more tellingly portrayed. It might well be asked why the poet became enamored of old furniture. We find this zest for old things and persons who have not outgrown their childhood. They cling to the past and immerse themselves in the old interests of their life. They everlastingly remain children. All collectors are children, just as all children are collectors. The child's delight in collecting is well known. Who in his youth has not collected stones, shells, beetles, stamps, or coins? How few have kept up this passion for collecting in later life? This delight in a number of objects is soon superseded by the joy of monopoly. We want one thing only, but it must be priceless, and ours for life. It is the old struggle between polygamy and monogamy, between the idea of a harem and that of eternal fidelity. The collector is a Don Juan in imagination, but in reality he may be an ascetic or the most faithful of husbands. He compensates himself through his harem. He transfers his polygamous inclinations to harmless objects. This is especially noticeable in the case of the consciously erotic collector, the fetishist. He lives a chaste life and can renounce the thought of marriage if only he has his fetish at his disposal. He collects women's shoes and experiences all the ecstasies of being in love. He is thrilled with passionate feelings as though it were reality and not merely a pastime. We see here a clear example of that transfer of emotions, of which I propose giving a few more examples in this book. The desire in its inception, purely erotic, transfers itself from the complete object to a symbol. All collectors are victims of erotic symbolism. They are never satisfied. They draw their sustenance from spirits. They feed their love hunger with shadowy phantoms. 
For this reason, the collector never attains peace. He never ceases to collect. Should we sell his collection, he immediately starts another, or he goes in for exchanging, improving, altering. He only stops collecting when the greatest of all collectors removes him from earthly activities. Oh, if only people knew what an amount of love and pain vainly expend themselves at auctions where these collections are disposed of, they would shrink from the acquisition of them. But it appears that life would be impossible if we took everything so seriously. Our joys are rum from others' woes. The value of the quarry to a Don Juan consists in the fact that it is the wife of another that he is pursuing. So a collector is happy if he can secure a valuable specimen from another owner. If the collector is a Don Juan in disguise, he has a distinct advantage over his notorious exemplar, who frittered his life away in the hunt after lust. The objects of the collector's desire do not lose their value so easily. On the contrary, they increase in value with age. The stamp, which is almost valueless today, will be a rarity in a hundred years. Furniture increases in worth as it grows older. But women... Yet we forget that those whom Don Juan possessed remained eternally young in his memory. He was, in fact, a collector of memories. How much in life is nothing but an idle collection of memories, which are dissipated into nothingness? End of The Collector by Wilhelm Stiekel